Hello everyone and welcome to today's GiveCo Galaxy Tour webinar on Mastering Basic Cell Culture Techniques. I am Jennifer Woods of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by GiveCo by Thermo Fisher Scientific. For everyone who is attending the webinar today, we know that understanding cell culture is essential for the life of your work. This GIBCO Galaxy Tour webinar aims to connect you to GIBCO experts who will share their knowledge and experience in order to help you master cell culture basics and achieve consistent results. I would like to welcome our two speakers for today, Brittany Ballhouse, Cell Biology R&D Scientist from Thermo Fisher Scientific, who will discuss a basic topic, Introduction to Cell Culture, and then share her experience with the Thermo Fisher Cell Culture products she uses in the lab every day. Our second speaker, Chris Scanlon, is our Senior Global Market Development Manager, who is well-versed in our FBS products. He will help you understand the basics of FBS, and why you should be using Gibco SBS in your everyday work. Let us welcome Brittany to start the presentation. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, everyone. As Jennifer said, my name is Brittany Ballhouse, and I'm a research and development scientist in cell biology at Thermo Fisher Scientific. I've been doing cell culture for about 10 years now, and I'm very excited to introduce you to the world of growing cells and to provide some lessons learned from my experience. Today, we will first discuss an overview of cell culture, then go over some key terminology. Next, we'll walk through a typical cell culture workflow and examine the products that are required for that process. Finally, I'll share where you can find more information on cell culture. So to start, what is cell culture? Broadly speaking, cell culture is the process by which you keep plant and animal cells alive and dividing in vitro or outside of the body from which they came. Researchers, researchers have been doing this for more than 100 years now, and we've gotten pretty good at it. We are now able to keep many different types of cells happy and healthy in vitro for extended, extended periods of time. Keeping these cells happy and healthy, however, requires very specific tools that are dependent on the type of cells you would like to culture. There are several critical components that are common to all cell culture workflows. The most critical component is, of course, the cells. Cells can be isolated from tissues or procured from a commercial vendor or even another lab. However, before you get the cells in hand, you want to set up the environment required to keep them alive. This involves several other components. Uh, first, you need a complete cell culture medium and supplements, uh, or excuse me, a complete cell culture medium that is made up of basal media and supplements. Uh, then you need a cell culture vessel that is appropriate for your cell type, and you need an incubator. We'll go into more detail on the media, supplements, and culture vessels a little later on. Now there are several main categories of cell cultures. Starting in the center here, cell lines are cells that can be cultured continuously. This means that a researcher can put the cells into a cell culture vessel with medium, and the cells will divide until the vessel is almost full. Then a fraction of those cells can be removed from that vessel and placed into another vessel with fresh culture medium, and that process can be repeated indefinitely. Primary cells, on the other hand, cannot be moved from vessel to vessel indefinitely, but rather they just stop dividing after a while. Moving to cell strain culture, this is when you isolate one particular cell from the population of cells in a cell line that has some attribute you like and allow it to divide and make copies of itself over and over again until you have a new cell line that is different than the original culture. Now, whether primary cells or cell lines, not all cells grow in the same cell culture vessels. Some cells need to anchor themselves down to divide, and this requires them to be cultured on a specially treated surface. Those cells are called adherent cells. 
because adherent cells lay down and spread on the cell culture surface, they are limited by the amount of surface area in the vessel. You need to move a fraction of them to a new cell culture vessel periodically so that they will keep dividing continuously. Suspension cells, on the other hand, do not need to adhere to a surface in order to divide. They are perfectly happy floating in the cell culture medium. Some suspension cells uh, can be cultured in static conditions and some must be agitated. For suspension cells, uh, they are not limited by surface area, but rather limited by the amount of nutrients in the, in the media, as well as the waste products that they are secreting. So just like adherent cultures, you must periodically move a fraction of these cells to a new culture vessel with fresh culture medium in order to keep them alive and dividing. You can see examples of the types of culture vessels or flasks you might use for adherent versus suspension culture in the pictures at the bottom. As discussed on the previous slide, every few days or so, you will need to move a fraction of your cells from one culture vessel to another so that the adherent cells have more space and, uh, and the suspension cells more nutrients um, and they can keep dividing. The technical name for this process is subculturing, though you will also commonly hear it called passaging or splitting. It's important you keep an eye on your ongoing cultures to make sure that they are not running out of space or nutrients in the media and in order to judge the right time to passage your cells. For adherent cells, you'll want to examine them with a microscope often, often to see the proportion of growth surface area that is being covered by the cells. This uh, proportion or percentage of the area that is being covered is called confluency. It is detrimental to your cells if you passage when the confluency is too high or even too low. So typically you wanna passage the cells when they're about 70 to 80% confluent or covering about 70 to 80% of the available surface area. There is no confluency for suspension cells, rather it is referred to as density, which is the uh, number of cells per volume of media. During the passaging process, you'll ideally count your cells to know what volume of cell solution to seed or put into your new culture vessel. When counting, it is best practice to also check the cell viability or the percentage of cells that are alive in your culture. Next, if you're growing stem cells, you may be familiar with the round clusters of cells pictured in the middle here. Those clusters, which originate from a single or small number of cells are called colonies. And you often wanna maintain small fragments of those colonies when you passage stem cells. Finally, on the right, we have contamination. If you notice that your cell culture medium is cloudy or you see fuzzy stuff growing in your flask, you likely have bacterial or fungal contamination respectively. When you are doing cell culture, it is extremely important that you follow the rules of the aseptic technique to reduce the risk of contamination. So more on aseptic technique. Uh, aseptic technique is a set of guidelines that helps prevent contamination from microorganisms. It is done in a specific workspace known as a biosafety cabinet, uh, also known as a cell culture hood. Aseptic technique, bio, uh, Biosafety cabinets and personal protective equipment, or PPE, work together to keep you safe from the cells and also keep the cells safe from you. As an example of how these practices coincide, upon entering the lab, I put on my lab coat, safety glasses, and nitrile gloves. I go to the biosafety cabinet, ensure that the fan is blowing at full capacity, uh, then spray the entire inside down with 70% ethanol. I minimize the number of times that I move my hands in and out of the biosafety cabinet, and I always spray my gloves down before uh, with 70% ethanol before bringing my, my hands into the hood to work. And the, both of those things are part of good aseptic technique. So as you can tell, aseptic technique is truly key to keeping your cell cultures healthy 
So please visit the GIBCO Cell Culture Basics website uh, to watch a video on how it works and to learn more. Now let's go through an example cell culture workflow, which is subculturing or passaging adherent cells. As we look at the process in more detail, we'll discuss the specifics of the products you'll need to successfully culture your cells. The first step we'll talk about here is dissociating adherent cells from the growth surface. In most cases, your cells will be pretty firmly attached uh, and spread on the plastic of the culture vessel. So with this step, you add a reagent to the flask to get the cells to let go of the plastic, fall up, and float in solution so that they can be removed from the vessel. Here is a typical dissociation protocol for adherent cells. First, you aspirate or remove the cell culture medium from the vessel, then add a saline solution to wash the cell monolayer and remove any residual medium. Then you remove the saline solution and add in this dissociation reagent and incubate the cells so that they lift off of the plastic. After the incubation period, you'll wanna check the cells on the microscope to make sure that they are all free floating. And if they are, you would then quickly add fresh culture medium to the vessel to dilute the dissociation reagent. Finally, you'll be able to move the cells to a conical and continue with the rest of the cell subculturing workflow. From this protocol, I'd like to take a minute to talk a little bit more about saline solutions and dissociation reagents. So there are many uses for buffered salt solutions, otherwise known as saline solutions, in the cell culture lab. And depending on your purpose, you may want to choose different types. For cell washing during the subculturing workflow, you will want to choose a saline solution that does not have any calcium or magnesium since those components can reduce the effectiveness of the dissociation reagent. However, if you need to keep the cells in saline solution for a longer period of time, you may want to use a saline solution that has, has calcium and magnesium in there so that the cells will be happier over that period of time. Phenol red is a very useful compound that gives you a visual indication of how close to physiological pH your solution is. I typically don't see this compound in my saline solutions, but I almost always have it in my cell culture medium. With the compound in there, uh, your, if your solution is at physiological pH, so around 7.4, then it'll be red. If the solution is acidic, it will be yellow. And if the solution is basic, it will be purple. With in that way, it is, you can easily tell whether or not your solution will be um, good for your cells and, and at that physiological pH. Another common component is sodium bicarbonate, which helps keep the pH neutral. So remember to check the scientific literature or um, and the product literature to decide which version of buffered salt solution is appropriate for your, both your cell type and your application. Most dissociation reagents are enzyme solutions that break down the proteins that keep the cells attached to the growth surface. That's why when you add it, your cells will release from the plastic and, and ball up and float in solution. From that point forward in the passaging process, you can treat them like suspension cells. It is important that after your cells lift, you do add that complete cult cell culture medium in order to dilute the dissociation dissociation reagent uh, so that it doesn't damage your cells. When looking for dissociation reagents, you will want to choose one that is appropriate for your cell type and your experiment. One dissociation reagent that I really like when I culture cell lines is our triple product pictured here. Whereas TRIPS and EDTA must be stored frozen, triple is stored at room temperature, so I never have to worry about aliquoting and thawing it as I get ready to passage. It is also gentler on cells and protects cell surface proteins, as you can see from the data at right. So if this is appropriate for, for your cell type, I highly recommend using Triple. It's a great product. So back to our cell culture workflow. Now our cells have lifted off the plastic, 
and are in solution. And the next step is to count the cells. And so this is where you would pick up if you were growing suspension cells. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I highly recommend checking viability and uh, counting your cells every time you passage. So you can quickly determine if something is going wrong in your culture, like if your culture is contaminated, for instance. So how do you check viability and count? Well, the traditional way is by using a device called a hemocytometer pictured on the far left here. To use it, you add your cell solution to a grid that can be seen on the microscope. And you manually count the cells with, within the grid squares. If using a hemocytometer, I recommend counting a total of three of the four outer grid squares and using the average. From the average cell count, you can back calculate the concentration of the cells in the solution. That same process is done automatically for you with the Countess automated cell, cell counter. For both, however, I also recommend that you dilute your cell solution one-to-one -one with Tripan Blue, and you would need to account for that one-to-one -one dilution on the hemocytometer. Um, but that's how you check cell vi viability. If the trifan blue gets inside the cell, that cell is dead, and you'll want to exclude it when you calculate how many cells you should feed into your new vessel. That way, you're only feeding cells that are alive. Using a hemocytometer will absolutely work for maintaining your cell cultures, but if you need really high reproducibility between counts uh, or in counts between you and another researcher, you may want to consider the this Countess automated cell counter um, and as shown by the reduction in user to user variability at, in the data at the right. So now you know that your culture is 95% viable and you have calculated how many cells you wanna add to your new culture vessel. The next step is to fill your culture vessel with fresh complete medium. So let's talk more about what complete culture medium is. The majority of complete culture medium is called basal medium. There are many different types of basal media out there, but they are all basically a mixture of salts, amino acids, vitamins, and sugars. Like the buffered salt solutions we spoke of earlier, they also include buffers that maintain pH in a range that keeps cells happy and um, most also have phenol red so that you can tell that the pH is physiological. The phenol red is especially useful for culture media since cells uh, will make the media acidic as they divide and eat up all the nutrients in the media. In other words, the media in your cell culture vessel will go from red to yellow as the cells grow. When the media is yellow, it is very important that you immediately change it to keep your cells happy. Before uh, using basal media for your cell culture, you usually must supplement it with additional nutrients to make it complete. We'll talk more about those supplements in a moment. With more than 100 different kinds of basal media out there, you'll likely want to read the scientific literature or ask your colleagues for advice on which formulation of basal medium is most appropriate for your cell type. One other thing to note on basal media um, and about actually many other cell culture reagents as well is that the components of the products are light sensitive, which means that after a certain amount of exposure to light, the media or the reagent will stop working as well. Therefore, it's important that if you see the little symbol that looks like a little house with a sun over the top of it on your product, you minimize the light exposure for that product. This is especially important for our bench stable basal media as before it is supplemented with serum, it can be stored outside of the refrigerator at room temperature. But that media's sensitivity to light is why it comes in a little cardboard box. Um, so you need to store it in that cardboard box so that it, is, it stays protected from the light. But again, all, all media and many other cell culture products are sensitive to light. So it's good to be aware of how much light they are seeing. If your lab has refrigerators with glass doors, you may want to consider covering the glass for that reason. 
And if you store your media in a cold room, you need to be especially careful and turn the lights out when you leave. Keep an eye out for that symbol to keep your media and reagents working at their best. As I mentioned earlier, basal media most often needs to be supplemented with additional components before it offers your cells the complete spectrum of nutrients they need. Many cell types require serum, like fetal bovine serum or FCS, and they also need a source of glutamine. For glutamine, Thermo Fisher has a cool product called Glutamax. Uh, typically, glut glutamine must be stored frozen, but I like Glutamax because it can be stored at room temperature, so you don't have to worry about aliquoting and thawing it. Also, glutamine in complete culture medium degrades rather quickly, and Glutamax is far more stable, as you can see at the data at right. This means that your cells are seeing more stable levels of glutamine over time. Other supplements that are common for more sensitive uh, cell types are, are non-essential amino acids and a variety of recombinant proteins. Uh, you may also want to add antibiotics like uh, penicillin streptomycin or penstrep to your complete culture medium in order to reduce the risk of contamination. So now let's take a, a little closer look at serum and antibiotics. Serum is the most used cell culture supplement as it has many, many good growth factors and nutrients in it that make many cell types very happy. For all of the cancer cells that cell lines that I grow, I use 10% fetal bovine serum um, in my culture media. However, because serum comes from animals, it is considered undefined, which means that it varies batch to batch. Um, and can have slightly different percentages of specific growth factors or hormones, for instance. This undefined nature of serum was never a problem for me growing my cancer cell lines, but for some cell types or experiments, it may be. For that reason, Thermo Fisher has specific versions or specialty sera that have been further validated to work with specific cell types like stem cells, or that may be used for specific purposes like hormone studies. We'll hear more on Sarah from my colleague, Chris, a little later on. As I referenced previously, antibiotics may also be added to complete culture medium in order to reduce the risk of contamination. Antibiotics are not a substitute for good aseptic technique. However, they are more like extra insurance. They may also be extremely necessary if you're working with cells that are freshly isolated from tissue or if you're trying to get a specific clone to grow exclusively. For routine cell culture of cancer cell lines, for instance, you may not need antibiotics and may not want to use them as they can mask low-grade contamination uh, and can be toxic to your cells long-term. But if you're nervous about contamination, and especially if you're new to aseptic technique, they can be a good tool to use. Next, let's dig in uh, to the different kinds of cell culture vessels a little bit more. The most important things to consider when choosing a cell culture vessel are, are you growing adherent cells or suspension cells? And also to consider the purpose for that vessel. Is it scaling up or a downstream assay? Most commonly, you will probably use cell culture flasks for routine culture. For industrial applications where you need a lot of cells, you may be using bioreactors for your suspension culture. For most downstream assays, you will probably want to use multi-well plates uh, where you can treat your cells with many different experimental conditions. Finally, if your primary goal is to immunostain and image your cells, you may want to use chamber slides so you can get the best images on the microscope. If you're trying to decide how many cells to feed into a new type of culture vessel, uh, our useful numbers for cell culture page is also very helpful and I use it often. You can also explore all the many different options we have for culture vessels at thermofisher.com slash cell culture plastics. And back to our cell culture workflow. Last but not least, 
we have to check your cells regularly. It is very important to examine your cells at least once every two to three days in order to make sure they're not contaminated, that they're happy and healthy. The kinds of questions I ask myself when I check my cultures are the following. What is the color of my media? Is it red, is it yellow? Do I need to change it? Is the media cloudy or do I see an unexpected, unexpected amount of debris? That would be an indication of contamination. Is the morphology of my cells what I expect it to be? What is the confluency of my adherent culture? Is it time to passage? To judge uh, confluency especially, you need to look at your cells under a microscope often. Uh, the one it pictured at right is ours. Um, though any microscope will work for routine culture, one cool feature I wanted to call out on this one is a built-in confluency measurement feature that it has. So everyone in your lab will be able to judge confluency the same way. But regardless of the type of microscope you use, the most important thing is that you're keeping an eye on your cultures on a regular basis. It is also important to realize that although we are pretty good at keeping cells healthy and dividing in the artificial environment of cell culture media and incubators, the cells are still growing in an environment that is very, very different than the human body. This artificial environment can cause individual cells that are better at surviving in those non-physiological conditions to start to take over the culture since they have an adaptive advantage. Over many passages, this means that there can be a genetic drift of the culture and the cells no longer reflect the original stock of cells. To protect against this and to make your experiments more reproducible, it is important to quickly expand any new cells you get and bank or freeze your cell stocks in cryopreservation medium for later use. That way, you can thaw from your frozen bank culture the cells for 10 to 20 passages, then dispose of those and start again from your banked cells. This is best practice to ensure that your cells don't drift too far from the original culture. And that is all we have today. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to cell culture. All the details from what we discussed today can be found at thermofisher.com slash cellculturebasics including videos on important topics like aseptic technique, thawing and banking cells, and passaging. You can also find the Cell Culture Basics Handbook, which I highly recommend. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Brittany, for providing such wonderful insights on your cell culture work. I would now like to invite Chris Scanlon to share more about Gibco FBS and how it is essential for your cells. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, Brittany. Great presentation. Um, so yeah, as Jennifer mentioned, I'm going to go through my presentation understanding the basics of FBS and why I choose Gibco FBS. And I am, as mentioned before, I am a senior global market development manager at Thermo Fisher Scientific, and I've been with the company it's hard to believe, but for, for 15 years. So let me dive right into the presentation. So as I mentioned, in the first slide, I'm going to really go right into the basics of what is serum. I know a lot of people probably on this, um, on this webinar have heard of FBS or serum and have come across it probably many times in their lab. And what serum is, is you know, in very simple terms, it's that amber color that you see in that bottle to the right. And it's basically animal serum that has been spun down through centrifugation and it removes all the red blood cells and you get that amber color that you see in that bottle. And the most popular serum is the FBS and that's blood drawn from a cow a bovine fetus and actually collected in a closed system, which basically means the system is not exposed to air to keep away any contaminants. And why is it used? Serum, actually, as Brittany touched to, serum has been used because it's a great reagent when it comes to culturing cells in a, in a cell culture system. It really gives you that viability and that really that um, protection to ensure those cells thrive in that environment. 
and it, it's used a lot for its growth factors, its, its attachment factors, and many other components. As you can see here, there's over a thousand components in serum. A lot of those things pertain to proteins, electrolytes, lipids, um, and, and a lot of them are actually undefined as well. So I'll go more into some of those details in a later slide. So what is it used for? As I mentioned, and, and Brittany also touched on this as well, it's used in cell culture to um, just be a really, and it's the most widely used reagent as well when using you know, eukaryotic cells. And it's also, with, in most cases, it's used in all sorts of applications. But the one serum, as I touched on, that is really the most favorite with researchers across the globe is FBS. Some even call it the magic bullet. And that's because it's, it basically works with so many cell lines and primary cells as well. So who uses it? Both researchers and manufacturers use um, this product in their cell culture medium. And they use it for all sorts of things that I touched on. They use it for vaccine production. They use it for animal diagnostics and so much more. So important factors to consider in serum selection. As I touched on, serum protects cells. It, it protects for all sorts of things like large pH shifts, toxic agents. Also another important factor in serum selection is cell growth. Not necessarily the, the quickness of your cell growth. Some people don't necessarily need the cells to grow fast, but it's really around the focus on consistency and reproducibility that is paramount when it comes to using serum in a culture system. And also no detectable contaminants contaminants that can be introduced as well. Obviously, that's a very important and obvious thing that's, um, you know, for you to consider when selecting serum. And this is kind of an overview of all the, all the things that we know that uh, that's actually in serum, that are rich sources of that in serum, all sorts of animal serum, even more so in fetal bovine serum. And as I mentioned before, it, it provides the most robust cell culture system for the widest range of cell types for both cell lines and primary cells. And that's why people love not only serum, but most importantly, FBS. And that's because they can just buy that FBS and have it across all of the cell lines or primary cells they're using their lab, rather than buying various reagents that might be, you know, more conducive to certain applications and then other ones for, you know, maybe that are animal origin free. The FBS really provides that ability to work across all those cell lines and really offer that one reagent solution. And as you can see, it has lipids, hormones, various nutrients for growth, um, buffers. So it's a really great thing. The only thing that I, I know for a lot of researchers that causes a little bit of um, hesitancy with Sarah is that it's undefined. Even with all those great elements that are in there, there's still elements to this date that are undefined. And, and people have been using serum for over, almost over 60 years now. And it does vary from lot to lot because of that undefined element. But typically, when people are using serum, they tend to use anywhere from 5 to 10 percent um, in their basal medium. It tends to be the concentration they use, and it can vary, again, based on the application. So what causes researchers, you know, when they're choosing FBS, what concerns them the most, especially with FBS? It's the price fluctuation. And I'm going to go into a slide coming up and what why price fluctuates, but that is definitely a concern, um, you know, knowing that they have, in many cases, a certain budget that they can spend on all their reagents and other things they need in the lab. They want to really make sure that they can control that price when it comes to FBS. Also, the product integrity. They want to make sure they're getting a product that can deliver on that consistency that I mentioned before. Also, supply continuity. Depending on what FBS you're using, sometimes the supply can be plentiful, other years, it might be tight. So knowing, kind of working very closely with their suppliers to ensure they have that supply continuity, especially those who are using a lot of it. Also, lots of lot consistency. As I mentioned with the undefined element, it's very important that they have that consistency because that really helps them get to that end goal in many cases of getting published. And also reproducible results. That's also tied into ensuring that they can get published and other, other, other folks see that publication and, re, and can reproduce those uh, same results that um, was done in a particular lab that, that actually got published. And finally, workflow solutions. Sometimes people don't think of this, but a lot of researchers like to see if there's workflow solutions that can enhance or, or speed up their workflows. One, one quick example is our one shot, which is pre aliquoted 50 ml bottles. So those are things that a lot of times customers maybe might not initially think about, but when you offer that to them, they really like those options. They can really reduce time, 
as well as at the risk of contamination. So as I mentioned before, price and, flux, um, and supply can really fluctuate, and this slide really talks to the market dynamics of the global Sarah market. Um, one thing that's important to note with Sarah is that we have really very little control over the supply. We are a byproduct of the meat packing industry. So if we need more supply in a calendar year, it's very unlikely we can get it by going to the meat packing um, abattoirs and saying we need more. It's really not up to us. It's up to the meat industry to really dictate the kind of supply we can get. So we really have to think, you know, far ahead to really plan accordingly and work with our customers to understand their needs to ensure we can um, have the amount of supply that will be necessary for all our customers to do their research. And as you can see here, there's a lot of things that drive this. A lot of things sometimes people don't even think about, like whether it be weather patterns. I know folks probably hear all the time that there's droughts or floods that happen around the world. And those can have some you know, serious impact on the serum industry. For example, when there's droughts in Australia, what has to happen a lot of times, they bring those cows to the abattoir or also known as the slaughterhouse to, because they just can't, they don't have, because of the drought, they don't have the food, the water, all those kind of things. So they have to bring them to market, which basically brings more serum into the market. So for short term, it's a really great thing for researchers. There's more serum in the market. Long term, then, then there's a process of rebuilding. And there's all sorts of other things that can happen you know, with the beef and dairy demand, also with market behavior, with things that can happen in the market that are unpredictable, like we just saw with COVID, the pandemic. So all these things play a, a part in the volatility sometimes with FPS and serum. And as you can see, the cost index we have on the left, it really shows you since 2002, the fluctuation of, of the cost of, of the raw material over the, calendar, over the, you know, almost 20 years now. And also the cost volatility comparison. A lot of people are very familiar with corn, crude oil, and gold as a commodity. But as you can see here, Aussie FBS, Australian FBS, and US FBS have more volatility than the, some of the more common commodities that we're, you know, we use every day. So like I said, we really have to plan. And sometimes things are unpredictable, um, whether it be a pandemic or a certain weather um, uh, situation that can cause things to change quickly. So. That is why the market can fluctuate when it comes to price and supply. And this is just a really simple way of showing it. When there's drought, you know, high feed prices to feed the, the cattle, you know, high beef demand also you know, brings more to slaughter, which basically means more serum. And when there's herd rebuilding, after these kind of things happen, when there's a lot, a lot of cows brought to process, there tends to be a couple year process of rebuilding those herds if they're allowed to, if the, if the you know, weather and so on is conducive for rebuilding. And because of that, that means there'll be less serum to offer and price from that point can go up and also um, supply can be tight. And I'm not going to show you today, but there's a great video that really brings this all together, very brief, but really kind of explains why prices fluctuate. I hopefully I explained it as clearly as possible, but if you want a reminder or you want to share this with a, a colleague of yours, please go to our thermofisher.com forward slash FBS to check out this video that really summarizes it very nicely. Okay, so Gibco, the world of Gibco and where our um, FBS came from almost 60 years ago now. I mean, next year, Gibco will be celebrating 60 years in cell culture. It's unbelievable how long it's been around, but Gibco comes from Grand Island. Grand Island's a, a small little island in the Niagara River between the US and Canada. It's part of uh, New York State. And in 1962 is when Gibco came to be. And like I said, it's, it's been a huge impact on the, on the cell culture market ever since. And it continues to be so, continues to be that as we move in um, into 2022 and beyond. And one thing I want to um, stress, the one reason why a lot of scientists recommend Gibco Sera um, is really for you know five key areas innovation we're always innovating a market that you know most people look at as a commodity it's been around for a while as I touched on but we're constantly innovating whether it be the product in the bottle the bottle itself or technologies around that I'll get into a little bit more detail in, in the upcoming slides also the quality we take a lot of pride in our product we want to make sure we have the, the highest quality and we, we take all the measures to do so we're also the most cited um, that means people are using our product, our FBS and our other serum and getting results and are able to get published because of that. So that gives a lot of confidence for others who want to achieve the same goals 
to buy that product and hopefully at some point in their research career to get um, published as well. But as most trusted by pharma, um, 14 of the top 15 pharma companies use our product, whether it be for vaccine production or other therapeutic purposes. So it's a widely used with um, a lot of the big pharma companies and also our breath of line. We have a lot of products, a lot of, whether it be our value FPS, our premium, or our specialty line of FPS. A lot of things to offer for all the different cells or applications our researchers are using. So these are seven reasons why Gibco FBS. And as I mentioned before, it's not all about what's in the bottle, and what, it's what also transcends the bottle. Here at Gibco and Thermo Fisher Scientific, we always are trying to see, find ways to better, you know, cell culture research for the for our end users. And whether we can make the product inside the bottle better, the bottle, as I mentioned, or other things to really enhance that, that's what we look to. And one thing that we take a lot of pride in is that we're, we're a vertically integrated supply chain. And I'll go into that, um, what that means in detail, but that's something that we take a lot of pride in. Also the fact that we're ISIA traceability certified. ISIA stands for the International Serum Industry Association that you have to get certified um, to get that traceability mark. Also that we're um, CGMP compliant as well as ISO certified. Again, very high quality standards having those certifications and also the innovation in the bottle. I, I touched on one shot briefly, but we also have our boxy bottle that's been out since 2006 and was ergonomically designed to make for easier use in the lab. And also our fingerprinting. Um, and this allows us to give more origin reassurance, especially when you're, you're paying for those premium flavors like Australia, New Zealand, and US. And we also have our, um, our iMatch Serolot matching tool. This is a tool that our customers love. Right now, we, we primarily offer the iMatch tool in our North America and Europe markets, but soon we'll be bringing that to, to everyone that, who buys our serum. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that tool in a few slides. And then finally, we have our, our breadth of portfolio. Our products and cell culture work very well together. All our researchers in the lab use our products together. When I say use all of them, it's not only our FBS or serum, it's also our cell culture media reagents and our nunk plastics. And we know they work well together. So when you buy them together, you should, the goal is to get great, you know, optimal results. So that's another thing to consider that you can come to us and get all your cell culture requirements in one place. I've kind of touched on this a little bit already, but as you can see, um, both our bottles, we really take a lot of pride in innovation. These are bottles designed, the Gipco Boxy bottle, actually I misspoke, it came out in 2008. And this was designed really thinking around how customers use their media bottles. And obviously we use it for FBS as well, but it really has the wide mouth for easy pipetting and pouring, and a lot of other nice elements that really make it a very user-friendly bottle in a cell culture lab. Then in the one shot, this is a bottle that was designed specifically for FBS use. And you know it can take the abuse that you know bottles like that take when using it in FBS, the freeze-thaw cycle, you know, putting it in a hot water bath. Also not having to aliquot, it's a huge benefit of these bottles, as I mentioned before, but also it creates actually less waste. We know anywhere between 80 to 90% of researchers aliquot their FBS into conical tubes. And this bottle removes all that element, so you don't have to use uh, serological pipettes, you don't have to use conical tubes, as well as the, the bottles that the FBS come in. So it actually reduces plastic waste by 33%, which we know is a big issue in most labs around the world. And as I mentioned before, vertically integrated um, supply chain sounds like what the heck is that? What it is, is in, in the simplest terms, is that our, we actually, probably about 70% of our supply, we have Thermo Fisher trained collectors in the abattoirs or slaughterhouses collecting the serum from the source. So we have that oversight all the way through the whole process, all the way to the bottle getting into your lab. So it really ensures a couple things, traceability at the highest level, but also minimizes risks contamination as well, which we know a lot of our other our competitors, most of them rely on third party. So having that oversight is a really, we take a lot of pride in, and we really like to talk about that because it really helps us drive that quality message. Also, I'm not going to go into too much details of, on this slide, but what we like to talk about is our extraordinary measures of all the things that we do from collection all the way through to all the little add-ons that I touched on already with our bottles, our iMatch tool. 
this video series really shows you the details where you can see what we do to make our FBS. And when you have a chance, like I said before, go to thermofisher.com forward slash Gibco and have a chance. They're very brief videos. On average, they're about 80 seconds in duration. And they're, but they give you a great insight to what we do to make a great quality product. As I mentioned before, we have the ISIA traceability certification. We've had that since 2014. We take a lot of pride in it. We've been involved in ISIA for a, for a long time, ever since its inception back in 2006. And what the traceability program does, it, it maintains a record of traceability from the origin throughout the supply chain. So if anyone ever wants to see those, those records, we can offer that to them just to show that traceability and to ensure whatever it's saying on the bottle is what's in the bottle. And another thing we take a lot of pride in is we have manufacturing sites around the world that gives us the capability to continue to manufacture one at the highest level, but also have the capabilities at various sites to continue that manufacturing if any one site was ever impacted by weather or any other kind of event. So as you can see here, we have our initial site, which is in Grand Island, New York. We have one in Scotland, as well as two in Auckland and New Zealand in the ANZ region. Um, Sorry, Auckland, New Zealand, and Newcastle, Australia, sorry. So we have two in that region as well. I already talked to the one shot, but one thing I want to read on this slide that I really think brings to life the benefit of the one shot is that this came from a, a lab at the University of Washington in St. Louis. And this was from a person that was an early adopter of, F, of our one shot FBS and really loves the bottle and continues to use it to. Uh, to the present day and, and what she mentioned is that this bottle allows for the convenience of speed while maintaining a sterile product as we have lots of undergrads in our in and out of our lab this ensures that one mishap with not so aged hands doesn't ruin a whole pack of fbs so outside of all the other benefits this is another one that really stressed why people really love the aliquot free solution that is our one shot So Gipco FBS fingerprinting, this is something that we actually uh, worked with a group called Oratane to develop some years ago that again really helps give origin reassurance. And the reason why we did that, there were some unscrupulous suppliers in the past that would claim you know, what was in the bottle was Australian origin when it was a concoction of different origins. Um, it could have been Australian, US, and Australian all mixed into that bottle. And the reason why that's important, when you're paying a premium for a, a product like Australian FBS, you want to make sure that what's in the bottle is living up to this. And that's what FBS fingerprinting provides. It actually uses trace elements from those environments to be able to confirm it is, whether it be Australian, New Zealand, or U.S. We do it for our premium FBS because this is, those are the products that you pay a premium price for. So this is a great technology that gives our customers that reassurance for those products. And as I touched on before, iMesh is a tool that our customers, especially in North America and Europe at the moment, absolutely love. It's a tool that allows our Sarah specialist team to work with our customers to find them the perfect match, whether they use their previous gift code lot number or they use specifications that matter most to them, whether it be their endotoxin, hemoglobin, glucose, the list can go out. We can take those numbers that mean most to you, put it into our iMesh tool, and find that perfect match. And what that means for a lot of researchers, one, they no longer have to test, reduces the money and the time it takes to test. On average, most research, researchers take two to three weeks at least to test their FBS. It also shows that there's going to be the performance they need. They're going to get that from a match that meets a high standard to their previous lot. It also helps you know, increase the confidence in, the, in their research results. So this is a great tool. And one, one reason I wanted to really talk to it that in 2022, we're bringing this tool to the customers. It's going to be a customer facing tool where customers can go on to thermofisher.com and use it themselves to find that match, to find what we have currently in inventory that meets their closest specifications. And then they can purchase that online and continue on with their research with those consistent and reproducible results. And another thing we did very recently, I think it's about three years ago now, we, we we simplified our categories. We, had, we thought we had pretty clear categories, but we found out after quite extensive research that a lot of customers still weren't clear on how you delineated between our five categories that we had prior to the three. 
And we did a lot of work and we really simplified our categories to make that process of selecting the right one for, the, for our researchers a lot easier. So we have, now we have a value, a premium, and a specialty. And it's easy to delineate, as I mentioned before. For example, our value has up to 50 tests, our premium up to 96, and our specialty are their own breed of products, like our charcoal shrimp, exosome depleted, the list goes on. So it really helps them, our researchers come to the site and really decide what makes the most sense for them, depending on the cells they're using or the application they're dealing with. And finally, I'd like to you know, touch on uh, a great tool that you can go to uh, thermofisher.com forward slash FBS to download. It's our Gipco Sarah guidebook. And it gives a nice overview of our categories, touches on a lot of the things I touched on during this presentation about what makes Gipco unique, why people choose Gipco, a little bit about our, our history as well. It also talks about um, our iMatch Sarah Watt matching tool. So I highly recommend check out this tool for more information or if at any time you have more questions, don't hesitate to reach out to your Thermo Fisher sales representative, our, um, our, our customer service, or our tech support. We're always here to help or answer any questions you have. So I'll stop there. I want to thank everyone for their time. Thank you for, I hope this presentation, as well as Brittany, has been very helpful and insightful. I really enjoy presenting this information. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Brittany and Chris, for your insightful presentations. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you would like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located in the far left of your screen. Now let's get started. The first question is for Brittany. What do I do if I think my cultures are contaminated? Yes, yeah, so that's a, a great question. Um, and um, you know, just a little um, background. So again, this would be like, especially if your your cell culture media is cloudy or your growth rates are off um, or you see something fuzzy, <laughs> you definitely um, want, they definitely may be contaminated. And so the next step, um, if, if it's just, if it's mold contamination, there are a lot gloss cause. If it's bacterial contamination, your media is a little bit cloudy. Um, I still recommend just throwing away that culture and going back to those cultures that you have previously banked. Uh, that's the safest option. However, if it's a very precious cell culture and you can, it's absolutely irreplaceable, you can do a treatment with an antibiotic solution. Um, so typically that's like a five to 10% antibiotic solution that you would wash your cells with um, or incubate your cells with for adherent culture um, um, over you know, a, a longer period of time, um, changing it out four to five times, and then um, putting the regular uh, um, cell culture media with your regular amount of antibiotics back in after the treatment. But again, I don't recommend that unless it's a critical culture that you can absolutely not replace. All right, thank you, Brittany. And we have another question for you. This question says, my cells are growing very slowly. What could be the potential reason for this? Yep, so number one could be contamination, as I mentioned, but <laughs> um, beyond that, um, it, it also could have been that your cells maybe got a little too confluent if they're adherent cells or if they're suspension cells, you let them go too far um, and got they got too dense um, you can get um, if there's especially in the case of adherent cells you can you can have contact inhibition which can make your cells just stop growing um, if they're primary cells um, going beyond cell lines they might just um, be petering out um, so they will slow or, or as those primary cell cultures age and unfortunately at that point there's nothing you can do they're a finite culture um, in terms of cell lines, yeah, certainly um, making sure that you're passaging regularly, you're feeding regularly, those are the, the most important keys there. Um, and um, yeah, not, not letting them get overconfluent and of course being wary um, in case they, they may be contaminated. Those would be the most common reasons, I think. Thank you, Brittany. 
We have a question here for Chris. When considering purchasing my next batch of FBS, what information or tools does Gibco offer that can help me find a similar FBS as the previous lot I used? Well, I have kind of three quick um, options for you. Um, two apply now and one will apply in 2022. But the first one, if you have a current bottle of FBS that you're using from us and you have a, the lot number which should be on the bottle, you can check with your um, Thermo Fisher sales representative to see if any more of that lot is available in inventory. If it is, that's your best option to, to drive that consistency. Number two, a lot of those lots do sell out quite quickly. Um, so the second best option would be, if you don't have it already, request your, um, whether it be from Thermo or another supplier, your certificate of analysis, which gives you all the specifications that are in that um, lot of FBS, like your endo, hemo, glucose, estrogen. And from there, you can look in that certificate of analysis, find out what specs you, that you deem most important for your research, and then get a new certificate of analysis of available inventory and compare the two. And then when you see the closest match, I would recommend that would probably be your best option. And then thirdly, which will be coming, like I said, in 2022, is our iMatch uh, Serolot matching tool, which will be a global tool where customers can go online, put in their either their previous GIPCO lot number or specifications that matter to them, and find the closest match in our available inventory. So that'll be something that'll be very exciting, I think, for most once that is available. So those are, I would say, the best options for that purpose. Thank you, Chris. We have one last question here, and it's for Brittany. Can you share the guidelines on media selection for different cell types? Yeah, so there's a lot of different media options out there. <laughs> As I mentioned, even just basal media, there's a, a more than 100 kinds, different kinds, and um, there's a breadth of um, many supplements you can choose from as well. It's really cell type dependent. Um, you know, the first place I start when the culture can do cell type is the scientific literature, um, looking at, at protocols found there. Um, of course, your colleagues at um, your university, for instance, may um, will also be a great resource there. The other thing I might recommend, especially for, for newer products that are out there and for specialty cell types, um, would just be going to the thermofisher.com website and typing in your cell type and see if we have any cell type specific options there for you. We have a wide variety of stem cell media, for instance. Um, some of them are new, for instance. So um, you, they might not be in the literature quite yet, but that doesn't mean that they um, wouldn't be a great tool for culturing your cells. So just doing a quick search there, um, I would recommend as, as well. We have lots of great products there. Well, thank you, Brittany. Um, this wraps up our Gibco Galaxy Tour webinar today. We would like to thank Brittany Ballhouse and Chris Scanlon for sharing their knowledge and cell culture experience. And we would also like to thank um, the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. For questions we are unable to answer today, we will follow up with an answer via email. We hope all of you have gained knowledge today that will enhance your lab skills in the future. We would also like to thank LabRoots for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Lastly, we invite you to join us in September for the next Gibco Galaxy Tour webinar, which focuses on 3D cell culture. Until then, thank you and goodbye.